Today I want to talk about how food production and the role of the farmer has changed. Let's first paint a picture of the early 1900s. The majority of the population, about 60%, lived outside of the cities, near communities of fewer than 2,500 people, and many of these people were connected with farming. Only 40% of the population lived within the city. Many different families farmed land and kept livestock. Let's say Farmer Joe was a grain and dairy farmer. He could produce milk and deliver it right to his customers' doorsteps. Farmer Jane was a vegetable and chicken farmer. She could peddle her eggs and vegetables right through town. You could buy your tomatoes from Farmer Jane and ask her exactly how and where they were grown. Farmer Joe and Jane could get their livestock butchered in town, or better yet, get the butcher to visit their farm, which still happens in some rural areas today. You could buy cuts of meat from them, or they could add value to their products by selling roasted chicken or marinated pork chops. You could eat a steak and know exactly where the cow lived, what it ate, how it was treated, and how it died. And the best part, if you got sick from any meat, you would know exactly where it came from, and conditions could be inspected, procedures could be corrected. Farmer Joe owns 60 hectares of land, the average amount of owned agricultural land in the 1900s, which is about the size of 60 baseball fields put together. On his land, he grows grain crops and pasture for his cows. He could choose to store his grain on his farm and sell it when he needs to sell it. He can graze his cows on his pastures, milk them on his property, and sell the milk when he needs to. To, to kill the cows, he could ask a butcher to come to his property so the cows would be stress-free up until the minute they're killed. Farmer Jane owns her veggie crops, pastures, and chickens. She can butcher her chickens on her property herself and sell the meat from her farm and in town. The chicken lives a nice life, one that we typically today call free run or free range. They're happy and stress-free up until the minute they die. Back in these days, the average household spends about 46% of its total expenditure on food, which is produced within the community. Chicken from Jane, milk from Joe, bread from the local bakery. These days, back in 1900, people were connected to their food. They knew where their chicken, eggs, milk and cheese, apples came from. Most food was processed by the farmers themselves or within the homes. Now, let's zoom ahead and look at today, 2013. Today, the large majority of the population, about 75%, lives in the cities. Only 25% of our population lives in rural areas, and of those people, very few of them have any connection with farming. If you go out into the rural landscape now, few family farms exist. Many have been abandoned for lives in the city or bought out by larger farms. My grandpa is a farmer, and so is his dad. Over 40 years ago, his dad told him what he saw farming turning into. He said he saw it turning into more of a business where big companies own the land and farmers are only hired to manage it. Soon, my great-grandfather's prediction came true and many other family farms probably saw the same thing unraveling. Today, most land is owned by a few big farming businesses, with family farms holding on to a small percentage of land. I say farming businesses because it isn't Farmer Joe or Jane anymore. It's a company or corporation that owns the land or the chickens or the cows, and simply hires on a farmer to run the tractors or manage the animal factories. Yes, factories. Like we discussed in my earlier video, the chickens and pigs are kept in large-scale production factories where they're pumped with chemicals so they don't get sick and pumped with food so they get really fat. They're products on a conveyor belt, nothing more. But there are still Farmer Joes and, and Janes that exist today. We have many farmers still out there trying to raise livestock and produce crops ethically. Farmer Jane raises her chickens on healthy food, gives them adequate adequate space to be healthy and happy, and butchers them in a humane way. Raising a chicken this way costs more than keeping them in a space the size of a shoebox and putting them on a conveyor belt with a million other anonymous chickens where they'll, where they'll be mechanically killed. It costs more to treat them like they're a living, feeling being. And I don't mean feeling emotionally, I'm not getting into that, I mean feeling as in feeling pain something our current industrial animal production system ignores.
Now let's look more closely at a grain farmer of today. In the springtime, the farmer needs to purchase spray, seeds, and new equipment. All of these things will come from huge corporations called Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, Dow AgroSciences. Those four uh, control half of the world's seed supply. Other companies like Agrium and the Mosaic Company control the chemicals and fertilizers. It's a basic economic principle of supply and demand. When too few companies exist in the market, they control the prices. They can push out the smaller companies through competition, and then once they're not an option anymore, increase their prices, and farmers will have no other choice but to buy their seeds or chemicals from them. Furthermore, most of the chemical sprays used necessitate the use of certain genetically modified, or GMO, seeds, conveniently sold by the same companies. The sprays they sell will kill any other seed planted, except their GMO seed. Because of all of these upfront costs in the springtime, the farmers typically sign contracts where they're in debt to these companies until the fall. When the harvest comes and they harvest their crops, they sell their grain at market prices and pay back the companies, and then they do it all over again in the next spring. This is not a system built for the survival of the family farm. This system is built by large agribusinesses for the creation of more and bigger acre businesses. The average size of a farm today is 170 hectares or 170 baseball fields. The size of land or number of livestock has increased for these farmers, but their income hasn't increased. The control has been taken away from the farmer. They don't get to choose what they plant or spray or feed to their livestock, and they're at the mercy of the market and the companies they're indebted to. What is more, the farmer has little control and receives very little of the retail value of these products. Decades ago, a farmer received 91 cents of the retail dollar. A modern farmer today receives less than 9 cents of the retail dollar of the products they grow. This is because once the chicken leaves the farmer's hands, they're butchered, processed, salted, seasoned, roasted, dried, canned, made into chicken strips, chicken fingers, chicken wings, chicken soup, chicken stew, packaged in cans, plastics, boxes, and finally sold to huge superstores. A dairy farmer's cows are hooked up to machines that suck the milk into huge vats that are sold to companies for pasteurization. A dairy farm could actually receive hefty fines for selling milk before it's been pasteurized by these big companies. A farmer could receive hefty fines for butchering on their land, too. This is a process that should be regulated, definitely, but not restricted only to large slaughterhouses miles away. This also adds transport and processing costs. Butchering on the farm reduces stress and costs. Okay, so eating chicken and tomatoes isn't the same thing as it used to be, but going to the farmer's market is so expensive, right? It would be so costly to buy food from farmers trying to grow and raise food ethically. Well, let's take a look at what we're spending on food in 2013. Remember in 1900, we allocated almost half of our expenditure to food. Today, only 13% of our total expenditure is spent on food. To be fair, our family sizes have declined, so let's take that into account. We have less kids to feed. So dividing it by the average number in the household, we're still spending less on food than we used to. So why are we so fat? Sorry to put it so bluntly, but obesity has increased wildly in the last century in adults and in kids, which has also led to an increase in obesity-related diseases such as diabetes and heart problems. But how can this be if we're eating less food? We're not eating less food, we're eating the wrong kinds of food. Decades ago, we could buy local, fresh, nutritious food from farmers or the grocery store, and most of the food processing happened by the farmer or within the kitchen. Now we buy food from the grocery store that's already processed. It's not fresh, and it's not nutritious. It's canned with 90% of our daily salt intake. It's boxed in packages that have a long list of ingredients that you or I can't even pronounce. And companies that process these foods don't legally have to include all of their ingredients on their labels. 
Even the fruits and vegetables that you buy from large-scale stores have been genetically selected for their ability to stay colorful during their days of transit and days of shelf life. They're sprayed with chemicals and chemical fertilizers, most of which can't be simply washed off under the tap. The cheap foods most easily available to us, the ones that are the fastest to make in a hurry on weeknights, are the least healthy for us and our families. To summarize, our farmers have steadily lost control of their farms and of the food they produce. Even the farmers that haven't sold their land to the big corporations are still under their control. They have no free will of their own as long as they're farming conventionally because they're in the debt of these corporations season after season. Our food production is in the hands of a dozen or so corporate giants. We need to put the power back in the hands of our local farmers by supporting local producers at markets and by shopping and eating at stores and restaurants that purchase local products and ingredients. We need to encourage farmers to develop agricultural ecosystems, food forests, and multi-level cropping systems. By purchasing locally grown foods, we can select foods based on their ability to tolerate pests so that we don't need to apply chemicals to the land and for their nutrition so that we can get the vitamins and nutrients that our bodies need and not all die from heart disease. Farmers produce our food. We need those farmers to be people we can have a face-to-face -face honest conversation with. Someone we can ask, hey, can I come over and see the way your chickens are kept? And what exactly do you feed your tomatoes? And we, de we need to make sure that those same people work within an economy that supports them, not one where they're in debt all season, pressured to work more land, and forced to buy from one of four companies. 2007 agricultural census data reports that 15% of American farmers live below the federal poverty line. The average expenses of a farm exceed the revenue. Why do you think there are so many farm subsidy programs set up? Because farming doesn't pay. Why aren't young families flocking out into the countryside to make a living at farming? Because conventional agriculture is a broken system environmentally and economically. Our farming operations are set up much like a monoculture of annual plants. They survive under the assumptions that they will receive the same inputs every year. In one, it's chemicals. In the other, it's corporate credit. Let's transition our food system into one that instead resembles a perennial agricultural ecosystem, one that's self-sufficient and resilient, made to last for the benefit of future generations. And maybe 50 years from now, my great-grandchildren will be telling a story one day and they'll say, my great-grandmother hoped it would turn out this way, and boy am I glad it did. Thanks for watching, guys.